Welcome to the Tech Blog Writer Podcast, your guide to future tech trends and innovation in a language you understand. Now, over to your host, Neil Hughes. Welcome back to the Tech Blog Rider podcast. You have a very, very happy podcast host on your hands today. Because if I was to ask you, have you heard of Manchester United, the football club? You're going to say, of course. And regular listeners will know I had the pleasure of speaking to them just a couple of days ago about the digital transformation, not only of the football club, but sport in general. Now, as I record this, my team, Derby County, just knocked Man United out of the cup in a nail-biting 8-7 penalty shootout. So in short, nothing is going to bring me down today. But hey, this is a tech show, so I'm going to rein myself in a little. Now, over the last few weeks, I have received a few messages about the insurance industry. One saying, Neil, do you know any podcasts that tackle the insurance industry? And one from a company called SE2, who are helping the world's largest insurance and annuity carriers with the new capability to offer products to customers online and essentially help them move with the times. Now, SE2's digital platform helps carriers enhance or circumvent the traditional broker model, to which mid-market, primarily millennials, are averse to. So today, I want to talk about how insurance companies can reach millennials because their old way of doing things just looks creepy as hell to them, and also discuss the digital transformation of the insurance sector and the importance of innovation and culture change. So buckle up and hold on tight as I beam your ears all the way to Kansas so we can speak with Vinod Katru, Chief Information Officer at SE2. So a massive warm welcome to the show. Can you tell the listeners a little about who you are and what you do? So I consider myself to be a transformation player in what I call not so sexy insurance industry. It is basically an industry which is completely technology driven, completely dependent on technology and is uh, full of opportunities. If you look at uh, innovation, you look at uh, uh, modernization of technology, this industry has been uh, lagging behind. And I consider myself to be a builder uh, and a transformation leader for the last 30 years. And I have uh, done this, I've been very privileged and honored uh, to have done this across companies like AIG, uh, Prudential, uh, MetLife, and then also service providers like TCS, and now in uh, doing this thing all over in uh, SE2. I'm so glad you mentioned there, the, the big elephant in the room, that the insurance industry feels like to many people that it's been lagging behind for a long time. But that is changing, like you said. And I see too, yeah. you help the world's largest life insurance and annuity carriers with the new capability to offer products to customers online. But can you just help listeners visualise exactly what problems you solve at SE2 and also what makes you guys unique from other solutions out there? So what we solve for our clients and customers is uh, internally through a lot of their uh, aging technology and they're most of them are running on old uh, legacy platforms old legacy legacy architectures uh, which are very much uh, file feed and data feed driven not completely integrated and then through mergers and acquisitions they have acquired a lot of these legacy platforms which has created this cobweb for them that for them, the agility to do something, uh, either launch a new product or be able to service the existing customers at the right price points, create new operating models, create new service models is almost next to impossible based on the current platforms. Now, the choices they have are do it yourself uh, and the do-it-yourself choice has to rationalize their existing technologies. They don't usually see it comes back to, I look at my IP and my IP is my people. It comes to domain knowledge. It's very easy to find a Java programmer, but finding someone who has done life and annuity insurance business processing for many, many years and also can do Java programming, that person is worth his weight in gold for me. And that's what my partners are majority of the times they're missing. They they enter these large transformations, hundreds of millions of dollars in rationalizing their platforms. They cycle through at least a couple CIOs and then third CIO comes in and says, I got to do something different. It's not working out. 
What I provide them in SE2 is an alternative. It's an alternative to say you can keep running your current business. You want to be doing greenfield, running new, uh, launching new products faster, better. You want to enter and do something direct to consumer. You want to do something more digital in nature. I provide you an ecosystem which is available to you with no investment on your part other than you going on through a transformation on implementing your product and then integrating it into your corporate systems in the back end. So I provide them a very quick and a very cost effective alternative to launch into either innovation, digital or new product business. At the same time, now if you're sitting on 10 or 15 legacy platforms, you have uh, 15 plus billing systems, 15 correspondence systems, I can help you rationalize that picture relatively, very cost effectively, very cheaply. Typically, those transformations are very large transformations, but we do them in a very cost effective manner that your payback can come in less than two years. And then we can take 30, 40, 50% off your operating cost out uh, as well. So gives us a huge advantage in the marketplace to do that. So at a high level, I'll stop there. I can go on for hours and hours. <laughs> I'll ask you, have you asked me the next question? <laughs> now, listening to you there, I was going to say, because the, the culture change required to make any digital transformation a success must be incredibly daunting for a lot of these companies that you go to. So I'm curious, do you, do you come across any resistance at all? Absolutely. Uh, I, I would tell you, uh, it, I have been internally here at SE2, we, we were at a pretty good uh, place in our platform, but for the last 10 years, we hadn't made too many investments either, and we were running out of steam from scale perspective as well as from a modernization perspective. So I started a program internally called 10 by 10, which is we want to create 10x scale in our architecture, and we want to be at least 10 years out from a technology currency perspective. We evaluated every platform, every system we had internally, and we evaluated the technology sat on. If the technology wasn't going to be relevant in the next 10 years, we said get rid of it and upgrade it. And that's how we ended up in the industry's first end-to-end -end life and annuity digital platform. So we ended up there because we went through a 10 by 10 uh, journey for ourselves. The biggest aspect of the journey, okay, we spent $75 million doing it in the last two, two and a half years, has not been really technology upgrades and has not really been adopting digital and leveraging digital for us internally and for our clients. It has been the culture aspects of what we do. So internally, in the beginning, we didn't focus as much as on the organizational change management and culture transformation, but six, nine months into the journey, we realized that if we don't change the culture of the organization, we're going to look like, and again, for, I don't want to insult our clients, we're going to look like our clients. And then they have no motivation to really do business with us. We have to go through a culture transformation as well. So internally, we, have, we are on that journey, and that journey will continue. We are not done. Culture doesn't change overnight. And when I look at our clients, the culture transformation and their legacy mindset. And in many cases, a lot of the executives are very resistant to see insurance people used to be rewarded on a fast follower mentality, which is they, they never got rewarded for innovation historically. But now what they are realizing is the first more advantage in the marketplace is everything. And that's something new to the, uh, particularly to the life and annuity insurance executives. Many of them, they are like, you know what, I'm going to retire in five years. I don't have to make the tough decision. Let somebody else behind me make it. They they get, they, they, their DNA is risk management and they are very risk averse. So that has hurt. That has hurt us. Our biggest competition is not our competitors. We are way, way ahead of our competitors. Our biggest competition is our clients spending a lot of time with us going through the rationalization and transformation roadmap and then deciding to do nothing. So do nothing is my biggest competitor.
And I'm so glad that you've come on the show today, because one of the reasons I invited you was to discuss some of the culture and technological change trends that we're seeing out there. Uh, For example, I've read a lot recently about how millennials in particular are unfamiliar with all the benefits and guaranteed retirement income that results in that. So in a world where everything has been simplified, some of these products just seem to be stuck in the past. I mean, do you have any research or insights into these trends? Absolutely. So the industry is very complex. Uh, and it is complex by design. And the reason it is complex by design, the industry was built on basically having a captive distribution force. You had your own employees who were compensated by you as an insurance carrier, and they sold your products. And what you wanted to do was give them the best and the biggest toys and the tools out there that they can uh, talk when they sit in front of a client. Majority of the time, the distributors didn't understand what they were selling. Customers never understood what they were buying. That's why the regulation has to be so high, and there were a lot of bad sales practices in the industry. So our industry was complex by design. So if one of the competitors launched a product and created five riders, I had to create either more complex riders, or I had to create new riders, which will sit on top of these riders. And by the way, it didn't help anyone. End of the day, our customers are only looking for two things. Their needs are very basic. They are trying to cover mortality risk, and income risk. And the products have to be simpler. Now, as millennials and other folks are coming and becoming buyers in this uh, marketplace, and people are really focused on, I wouldn't call it underserved mid-markets, I would say not served mid-markets, because mid-markets don't have the affordability. They have the highest need, but the lowest affordability for the currently designed insurance products within life and annuity space. So people are realizing that they need to do drive a cultural change and a cultural transformation there. They have to drive product simplification. If they don't drive product simplification, so as an example, my daughter, I use my daughter, Trisha, uh, who is a senior in high school, as my case study every time I am talking out there. Trisha doesn't know how to talk to me. She will return my text message faster than my voicemail. And you think Trisha is going to sit in front of an agent and discuss, if you're not on her favorite device and you are not being talked on her favorite network, whatever that network is, okay, that's going to be some social media network out there. If you're not on the network, she'll still buy this kind of a product only when someone tells her that she has a need to buy it. She's not going to be waking up and saying, hey, she, she, will, she will be excited to buy a sports car rather than say, hey, I'm buying a life policy today. She's not going to be excited about it. But at some point, there will be a need to say, hey, Trisha, you need to worry about your mortality risk. You got your loved ones or you got liabilities that you need to counter with some level of mortality risk or income risk. So she may buy an annuity. She may buy a life policy. She's going to want to buy it from her trusted source. And if that trusted source is not going to be some level of self-service, She's not going to buy it. One of our clients, John Hancock, is betting big time on it. We launched their direct-to-consumer uh, digital annuity uh, on top of our platform in a very record uh, timeline to integrate a company uh, as big as John Hancock. We did it in less than four months. So it shows the capability and agility of our platform, and they have they are driving it through a consumer engagement platform and a wellness solution with the vitality. So so an amazing case study. I don't know if we uh, uh, in press can talk about John Hancock, but you can talk about a lead carrier, okay? You may not be able to quote their name because I don't have permission to quote their name, but that's a, that's a good case study in showing that they are going after millennials. They are seeing these use cases that they can create an automated product which can be issued in less than five minutes. So Trisha would love a five minute experience. If I told Trisha, Trisha, there's going to be an agent coming into the house. She, he, that person is going to sit in front of you across the kitchen table. He's going to have a 25 page a- app. He's going to ask you all kinds of questions and some questions you may not be comfortable with it. It's going to be detailed, integrate medical history. She's going to go back and then he's going to sell send someone who's going to take your blood take your urine, do some testing on you. And then in four weeks, they're going to tell you if they're going to even write you as an insurance and what kind of a risk are you. Tisha's going to say, are you crazy, daddy? That sounds creepy. I'm (laughs) never going to buy that product, right? So So if I tell her, Trisha, get on the John Hancock website and you can bind and you can answer like two 
maybe 10 questions. And based on 10 questions, they will underwrite you. And at the end of that, you'll have a policy print in your inbox. And by the way, if you choose to get discounted prices, they will even give you an Apple Watch for free. She's like, that, that's cool. I want to get it. So that's how you're going to go after millennials. So you have to go after them in a different manner. But that doesn't mean that the need for those some of those high-end products isn't there. Now, if Trisha becomes a millionaire or, God forbid, a billionaire at some point, she's going to need survivorship second to die. She's going to need some crazy uh, insurance policy for tax relief and other stuff. That time, you know what? She would want to sit with an advisor. She wouldn't want to do it herself. So it's not that Trisha will only do that. But if she's buying a term policy, she would not want to fill a 25-page app. So as someone that's outside of the industry, I do hear about insurance tech or insure tech on a regular basis. But I'm curious, has that phrase been taken seriously within the industry and has it been embraced within the industry? And will we see that old guard begin to struggle if they don't evolve in this digital age? So there is uh, there are two things happening in the industry. There's a lot of money flowing into those insure techs. Yeah. Uh, there's good money flowing into those insure techs, and there's bad money flowing into those insure techs. Some large companies, because their boards are demanding and asking them, what are you doing in this space? They are, to answer some of the, the board things, they are going out and finding the coolest company out there. They uh, think it's a cool company, not really looking at the value and IP, and they are investing in it. So there are hundreds of millions of dollars going in, which I would consider to be bad money, because some of those companies are... There's not a lot of IP behind it. There's not a lot of long-term value. Short-term, you see a bunch of cool screens and stuff like that. It sounds, oh, wow, this is great. There's nothing behind them, okay? And then there are some insure tech companies, which in particular spaces have done some fantastic work, particularly in the modern technology. So whether it is analytics, it is how best you can leverage data, underwriting, uh, how you can transform the underwriting model, uh, we are partnering with a bunch of those companies. We are invested in some of those companies, and we are partnering with a bunch of those companies as SE2 as well. So particularly in the consumer engagement space. So we are invested in a company called Life.io, which helps you basically with your lifestyle, helps gather a lot of data for underwriting, and also helps motivate you with rewards and other structure to be more healthy so that you basically are a better risk for the for the carrier. Uh, we are partnering with a company called Clarito, which is going to transform the underwriting model. They are taking a lot of the data from the health exchanges. And rather than you go and get uh, APSs from your uh, health providers and collect all the medical history, go after the Rx databases, which only maybe 90, 95% accurate, these people have access to all your medical data in a digitized form. And they're building algorithms on top, which are going to transform the industry from an underwriting perspective. You're going to make, you're going to underwriting decisions, not in days, but in minutes, in seconds. And the accuracy of those decisions could be in high 90s rather than be in low 80s, uh, high 80s to low 90s. So that's going to transform the marketplace. So, so I do see insure techs transforming and playing a great role. But then I also see a lot of buzz. I call them spreadsheet companies. Oh, I got an admin platform. I can issue a policy in 10 minutes. And you go and dig deep and there's nothing behind. There's a couple of tables and a rate structure in there, which anybody can create. Like I can have a programmer whip that kind of a thing in half a day in my innovation center, right? Yeah. But people are pushing millions and millions of dollars into those companies where there's nothing really behind them. So there's, there's good stuff happening. And then there is not so good stuff happening as well. It's a mixed bag. But everybody has realized, because their boards are demanding, has realized that innovation is going to be important for their future, for where they need to be, if they are not going to be innovating. But how they are approaching it and what they are doing may not always be right. So as someone with vast experience at MetLife, Prudential and AIG, before coming to SE2, I know you play a very big part in revolutionising technology at insurance companies. But where do you begin to ensure that the tech that you develop is not only fit for purpose, but also developed a technology platform that's future proof too? So we have really three tracks to worry about. I have a day to day business and operations to run where there is here and now. I partner very closely with my chief operating officer and I give him a little bit of an upper hand in understanding what do you need to do to run the business here and now. So there's going to be 
legacy problems for us as well because we took people's legacy platforms and legacy businesses over and we are running it on our platform so those issues you need to you need to have a team which is what i call the service delivery team those those people are focused on running the operations day to day running the businesses and keeping the lights on for here and now what we are doing and my teams are doing uh, is basically helping us transform our either current clients or future clients on helping them launch new innovative and creative products or take their legacy blocks and transform those legacy blocks onto our platform as we invest in scale and modernizing those platforms then there's a third tier which i look at to being very very important which is we have to be leading edge so in a way i act as an insurance company in my first track but when when i go to the third track i am just like an insure tech i am very nimble i am very agile and i am making the right investment so we have a very good structured innovation agenda i have my innovation center in new jersey and have some really really good smart folks uh, working there some very experienced people from the industry and then some cool kids who want to uh, play in the latest and the brightest things whether it is uh, how how we can effectively leverage robotic process automation which we have done and then it goes upstream as well so it starts to go into and influence the other two tracks as well rp is something 2 3 years back we experimented with and now is running mainstream and has gone out of the innovation cycle so at any point in time i'm fiddling around with hundreds of technologies or hundreds of companies out there then i approve like maybe 10% of those end up in some kind of proof of concept and then i would say another 2 uh, to 3% of them end up being then uh, uh, capabilities we create by working with some of our anchor clients so i have a very structured approach i have very unstructured way of looking at innovation looking at future proof in new technologies but a structured approach within that unstructured space in how we go from what i would call thought and idea to a real capability uh, for sc2 and i have to do that whether it it is uh, artificial intelligence machine learning how effectively you can leverage your data blockchain we are, we are right now leading the industry in blockchain uh, as well on how we can effectively leverage i see that as the next paradigm after internet which is going to transform how we do business is going to transform right away how the distribution of the products is working it's going to transform how some of the claims processing and other things within the industry are working so we are we are betting big on some of these key technologies and you will see on se2 website or you will see on se2 if you google us we are showcasing some of these things regularly in the industry forums as well so what mistakes do you see bus- businesses making in the industry and do you think that organizations really need to completely rethink their entire customer journey and build out new processes and transform their way of thinking to be successful in a digital age and obviously I think you do especially listening to that story about your daughter a few moments ago So I I would say I think industry is still uh, very conservative the industry is still very slow to move uh everybody talks about uh, the next generation they talk about future they talk about digital but then they go back into their comfort zones mm-hmm. and their comfort zones are how business runs in the market day to day to day they are not thinking 3 years 5 from now they talk about it they experiment with it but they're not really investing not everyone is investing some companies are but majority of the companies are not investing in how the business model needs to be reimagined or reinvented 3 to 5 years from now and that is a concern and se2 can definitely help them with those uh, journeys as they 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 look out so I, i every time i have a meeting with the new carrier executives they all are talking next generation and more and more we get down then they are saying how can i launch this product better faster cheaper in the marketplace and i need to launch it today then the future part of it uh, starts to take a back seat and that is a concern that is a big concern that they all talk next generation but then they do they they're still going back to their legacy mindset and legacy way of doing things So SE2 really does seem to be changing the way insurers go to market and quickening the pace of innovation and transforming new product development and the launch into service but what is the secret to accelerate in product innovation and keeping up to speed So I I I'm thinking like SE2 needs to be the Amazon of the industry 
So I am not trying to be the middleman here, helping people launch their products better, faster. I'm trying to, within my own platform, create as much configurability and self-service. So when you look at, I have three clients. The carrier is my client, the distributor is my client, and the end customer is my client. So we are running innovations for the end distributor and we are running innovations for the end customer. We are creating a lot more self-service capabilities for them. We are creating a lot more straight through processing capabilities for them. So in many ways, I'm looking to disfranchise my own business model. And my own business model, I'm trying to now enable the carrier to come on my platform and be able to launch their products in a relatively short span of time. So this industry used to launch products in 12 to 18 months. SE2 came with a revolution in the marketplace where we could launch a product in three to six months. We are challenging internally people in our labs and saying, how can you go three to six months from that timeline to three to six days? And what our answer to that is simplifying the architecture, which we have invested in, creating APIs from our platform, and then putting front ends where people can come back and design their own product and create their own configurability within those products. And you can automatically go to all our platforms in the back end by simplifying it and be able to launch your own products without, in some cases, with either minimal or no involvement from SE2. Today, we are internally making it faster, better, and cheaper. But then how can I take that capability and give it to the client? So in many ways, I make money by creating the framework and run transactions on my framework rather than helping people implement on my framework. Today, I make money having people implement on my framework as well. So in many ways, I'm learning from how Amazon business model works and trying to adopt that for SE2 by enabling our carriers. We, we never want to be in their business. We will never be a carrier or a distributor. We'll always be a platform and an enabler, but then enable our carriers to be more and more self-sufficient and self-reliant. So what's next for SE2 then? Is there, is there anything else that you can share with us today? What is next is to make that process much better, faster, cheaper. We are, we are going to be one of the leading technology innovators in the industry, but we're not doing technology for the sake of technology. We are doing technology which is going to be useful and relevant to life and annuity insurance. So we are domain people first. We think domain and we are innovating the domain and leveraging the technology which is already out there to enable transform the domain. And you will see us continuously investing in that space. We're going to be very focused just on life and annuity space and very focused on driving technology and platform innovations in that space. Well, a huge thank you for spending a little time with me today. You've really cleared up so many important factors around this industry. But before I do let you go, can you just remind the listeners of where they can find you online and maybe even contact a member of your team if they've got any questions after our conversation today? Absolutely. Uh, they can log on to se2.com. It is SE2 number two. We stand, our uh, company name is Service End to End. And that's what SE2 stands for, se2.com. And you will be able to uh, ask any questions. And my email would be vinod, V-I-N-O-D dot K-A-C-H-R-O-O at se2.com. They can send me a question as well. I'll be happy to answer uh, your listeners and your readers uh, as well. There are so many talking points off from our conversation today, like the culture change required to make a digital transformation a success and how many businesses find it daunting. But I really do applaud you guys for actually um, helping businesses embrace technological trends. It really is a big thing. So thanks so much for coming on and sharing that story with me today. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Neil. It was a pleasure uh, talking to you. I really did enjoy chatting with Vinod today. And I think he raised some interesting points because, in fact, by and large, millennials are unfamiliar with all the benefits of guaranteed retirement income and the results of these products. And in a world where we've simplified absolutely everything, many of these insurance products are almost impossible to understand. And I love the way Vinod re referred back to his daughter there. And, and if he was to say to her, we're going to sit you down and we're going to have someone go through all these complex questions and intrusive questions... They're going to think straight away, this is creepy as hell. And the whole concept around that old way of doing things just feels completely alien in a digital age. And like I said a few times during the show there, the culture change required to make a digital transformation a success can feel incredibly daunting. 
So I love the work that they're doing at SE2. And in 650 interviews on this show, I, I do believe this is the first interview from the insurance sector, which I think, again, speaks volumes. And my conversation with Vinod today feels, for me at least, about an untapped story that we very seldom get to hear about. But over to you. If you actually work in the insurance sector and you've got your own story about how technology is transforming it or resistance to change, I'd love to hear more about it. So email me techblogwriter at outlook.com or tweet me at Neil C. Hughes. Now I'm going to bring myself back down to earth after that exciting football game, but I will return tomorrow much more grounded with another great guest. I hope you'll join me again then. So thanks for listening. And until next time, don't be a stranger. Thanks for listening to the Tech Blog Writer Podcast. Until next time, remember, technology is best when it brings people together.